Hi, whether you're a first time YouTube guest or a long time member of our church, First Baptist Pulaski welcomes you. You know, our church family is messy. We are flawed. We have issues. We have sinned and fallen way short of what God desires and requires. But much of what motivates our worship is gratitude. See, God didn't leave us hopelessly wallowing around in the mud of our sin. No, He saw our need to be clean and sent His Son Jesus to take on human flesh, live the perfect life we could not, offer Himself on a cross as payment for our sins, and then rise victoriously from the dead. As Psalm 40 suggests, God lifted us up from the muck and mire, set our feet firmly on the rock of His Son, and put a new song of praise in our mouths. The truth is, we here at First Baptist Pulaski are imperfect people worshiping a perfect God. We hope the encounter you are about to have with Him puts a new song of praise in your mouth as well. And if you find yourself in our neck of the woods anytime soon, we would love to have you come worship, grow, and serve with us in person. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning, kids. I was going to bring you all up in the baptistry with me this morning, but there's just not enough room. So if you guys will pay attention real fast, I have something for you. This morning, we are going to see Miss Angelina get baptized, one of your friends, Miss Angelina Johnston, and we're excited about that. Uh, but I wanted to let you know what we're doing in Children's Church this morning. We are excited about what God's doing in our kids' ministry. And this morning, we're going to be talking about something pretty special uh, that Miss Angelina is going to get to experience today. Uh, but we're going to be talking about baptism. Now, some of you have already been baptized, and that's awesome. You know what it means to be baptized and what it symbolizes. But today, we're going to be talking about the, our Heavenly Father and how He loved His Son so much. The Bible tells us that He is His beloved Son in whom He is well pleased. And today, we are going to talk about how we can be pleasing, not only to our Heavenly Father uh, through baptism and through being saved and through those kinds of things, but also to our earthly parents. It's a good thing to be uh, to look good in their eyes and to be to do well in their eyes and uh, to be a good kid, right? And that's what we want to be. We want to be not only pleasing to our parents, but we want to be also pleasing to the Lord. And if we do those things, then I believe that like Jesus said, like God said to his son, uh, you would be the beloved son or daughter in whom they are well pleased. And so we're excited about what God's going to do today. If you guys will sit still for just a moment, we're going to baptize this morning and you pay attention uh, this morning. All right. This morning we're going to baptize Miss Angelina Johnston, and she's going to come on down. Go. Turn around this way right here. There we go. Now, Miss Angelina has been uh, expressed that she accepted Christ as her Savior, and we are excited about that. But I wanted to ask you, Angelina, have you put your faith and trust in Christ? Yeah. Yes, yes, you have. We're excited about that. Also, uh, let me ask you this: Are you? Uh, willing to share him with others and tell everybody else about him. Yes, yes that's awesome. Well, this morning, let's baptize you. And I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Now, church, this is what we talk about every week and when we have a baptism, and we are excited about taking the next step with people. And my question to you is this, is are you willing to walk with Angelina through this process of discipleship and to mentor her and to come alongside of her? If you are, would you say amen this morning? Amen. amen. Let's pray, and we'll get moving along with our service as we worship the Lord. Lord, we thank you for this day. <clears throat> we thank you for all you've done for us. We thank you for how amazing you are, God, that you would shed your precious blood for us and that we could take uh, the next steps in following you. And I pray that this service would be magnifying in your eyes, and God, that we would lift you up and we would worship you, not only in song, but Lord, as we sit through the service this morning, Lord, let's be in a prayerful heart for those around us, Lord, those who are lost as well. I pray that they would come to know you before it's too late. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen.
550 footsteps of Jesus. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4 of that one also. Father, today we come here in hopes of worshiping you. Father, we know your Holy Spirit is here. You've promised where two or three are gathered in your name, you'll be with us. And Father, today we ask that you guide our spirits, that we would worship you in spirit and truth. We pray for our pastor, that you'd speak to us through him and through your word. Father, we pray for our church as we've entered this partnership with Carlisle, that you would call out workers to go and to serve you and to glorify you there. Father, we pray for wisdom as we are making the decision about Oaxaca that you would lead us as whether we should enter that partnership with a people group that have never heard about you. They don't have your word in their language. They have no Christians. We pray that you would guide us in this decision in Jesus' name. Amen.
to be here with us last week, you know that we launched into a study of God's Word in the book of Colossians. And uh, after the service, Brother Aaron uh, kind of bumped into me in the hallway and he said, I was so excited that you were starting a series in Colossians. And then he kind of paused and he said, but I was a little surprised you landed it in that first section. Um, and what he's saying sort of gently is, that's a rough section to preach. And uh, it's also, I know, a rough section to listen to uh, at times. That, that is not a passage, the first eight verses of Colossians chapter 1. It's not a, it's not a passage that just flows really well, uh, humanly speaking. But there's a, there's a phrase in Latin about worship. Uh, it's called lex orandi, lex credendi basically means as we pray or as we worship, so we learn. And here's the lesson. One of the lessons, if we took nothing else from last week during our time in God's Word, is this. We would be wiser not to come to God's Word with a personal agenda. We would be wiser not to assume that there is nothing in a given passage. That's not what Brother Aaron was saying. That's not what I'm saying about the first eight verses of Colossians 1. Um, we are learning as a church family, even by going through a difficult passage like that, that God has spoken. All of His words captured in what we call the Bible, in our language, are truth. Your Sunday school teachers, your pastors, in this church, we believe that all of God's Word is inspired and is useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. All of God's Word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, able to do surgery on us, if you will. And how many times do we as God's people in our average week, A, pick up the Bible, uh, but B, when we pick it up, we have an agenda. I'm going to start in the back of my Bible and look for its subject and then find something that addresses my felt need. Now, there's nothing wrong with that because God speaks to us at our time of need. He wants us to dig into those areas. But if all we ever do is come to the Bible to speak and not be spoken to, we're missing it. If we come assuming we know that a passage says a certain thing or assuming a passage says nothing, then we've put ourselves in a pretty dangerous position. And so what we as a church family did last week is sort of humble ourselves and try to listen. Try to, try to get in a mode of, of hearing and submitting ourselves to the living God and His Word. Word of God speak, indeed, what we just sang about. You don't need to turn there, but in the book of 1 Samuel, Hannah's son that she had prayed for is now living in the temple with the priest Eli. 
Not surprisingly, his name is Samuel. So he's living there, and God had been dealing with him, and he was a little bit confused by that, and he goes and talks to Eli, and you may remember that conversation, and Eli basically says, paraphrased, if he wakes you up again, this is what you need to say. And when the Lord came and stood there and called, as before, Samuel, Samuel, Samuel responded, speak, for your servant is listening. Can we say that as God's people with a clear conscience today? The Lord came to me this morning and called Tony, Tony, and Tony responded, speak, your servant is listening. If you want God to speak, we sang about it, but would you say with me, Lord, speak, your servant is listening. Speak, your servant is listening. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 to 14, that's page 760 in those short pew Bibles there, and 1083 in the taller ones. For this reason, all those things we covered last week, since the day we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his, God's will, and all wisdom and spiritual understanding so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. We have redemption, the forgiveness of sins in him. There is a lot packed in there. The first question right out of the gate we could ask ourselves this morning is, who is being addressed here besides the church at Colossae? What group of people generally is being discussed or addressed here? If you look back up in verse 4, we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. If you look at the second part of verse 6 that we talked about last week, the gospel has come to you, it is bearing fruit and growing all over the world just as it has among you since the day you heard it and recognized God's grace in that truth. Verse 13 from today's passage, he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Verse 14, we have rescued redemption, the forgiveness of sins in him. So who is being addressed here? Christians, followers of Jesus, believers, the redeemed are being addressed here. So as those verses kind of washed over you just now, because of your faith in Christ Jesus, because of this good news that you accepted, because you have been transferred from one kingdom to another. Did something in your heart just swell? Did something in your heart just kind of warm and stretch and get excited at the thought of being God's child? Are you redeemed? When the choir was singing Psalm 63, my gracious, is the Lord worthy of that worship? Is he worthy of our praise? Is he holy and majestic and good? Does, as they were singing, is, is, does something in your, in your soul just resonate? Brother Bill prayed about worshiping in spirit and truth. Did, did something of that connect with you and the living God by his spirit say, Daughter, you are mine. Son, you are mine. His spirit bearing witness with ours that we are his children. Are you redeemed? Do you know that you're his child? 
If you don't, he wants you to. He wants you to have that assurance. He wants you to be able to have that sense of strength and purpose and, and some other things that we'll talk about today. He's addressing the redeemed. He's addressing here believers. And the first, the first big question of the day is, are you? And if like Angelina, you will turn to him in faith, confessing your sin and say, I need, I need your soul washing. That doesn't happen in the baptistry, of course. That's an outward sign of an inward change in faith. But it's a great picture for us. I want this for my soul, my spirit. Will you turn in faith and receive Christ and be identified with him and then resurrected in him? Are you redeemed? Then if you are, what does that say about what you have? as a daughter or son of the king, as one of the redeemed, as a Christian. Verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share with the saints or in the saints inheritance in the light. Some of your translations say joint inheritance and, and things like that. This, this is a picture, this is language used of, of God's people when they came back into the promised land that God had provided and he had apportioned sections of this land for the different tribes. So God, God had said, this is what I'm giving you, this is what I'm going to do, and when you get there, this is where you go. giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in that inheritance in the light. We learn in God's word that he dwells, he is so holy and pure and perfect, he dwells in unapproachable light. So now we are brought into the kingdom that he has promised and provided for in the light, this purity and holiness because he is there. This joint inheritance in the light, in his very presence, if you will. So we have a joint inheritance. In verse 13, he has rescued us from the domain of darkness. We've been rescued in Christ. And again, this is like that conquering leader who frees a people from captivity and delivers them to his kingdom. We've been freed and rescued from the domain of darkness, thinking about the kingdom of sin and death that pervades this world. C.S. Lewis said about Narnia, it's always winter, but never Christmas. When we think about the condition of this world and, and the the pain and the stress and the discouragement and the sickness and the death and the devastation even of a hurricane hitting Texas coast. And I, I hope that we're praying for relief efforts and for the gospel to advance and that the Lord would have us be ready if he calls on us to go. But being transferred, all those things remind us that not all is right in the world. That there may be some American prosperity and there may be some things about this world that are sort of good, it's, but it's kind of always winter. But never Christmas in the world apart from Christ. And for those of us in Christ, every day is Christmas. Every day we get to experience the gift of being his child. Every day we have blessing upon blessing, grace upon grace. Every day is Christmas for us. So are we sharing these Christmas presents with the world, this joint inheritance, this being rescued from one kingdom and delivered to another? Rescued from the domain of darkness, the rule of sin and death, and transferred into the kingdom of the son he loves. Again, in Angelina's baptism, that we are being identified with Christ. And our children are, are hearing in children's church in some respect, 
the baptism of Christ, he's also choosing to identify himself with us. It's mind-blowing. And we have that. It's Christmas every day. Verse 14, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins in him. This redemption is a pretty important word. If you are a new Christian or middle-aged, middle maturity or older Christian, we need to nail this word down. Redemption. It's, um, I grew up in the days where we had those uh, S&H green stamps or whatever. And you remember those books where you would put all those green stamps in the book and then you'd go to the store and you'd, you'd redeem those stamps for an item or items or whatever. So that item was paid for by those stamps. We have redemption. We have been paid for. We have been bought with a very high price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We have redemption. We have been bought out of the slave market of sin. Sin and slave, that slavery to sin and death is no longer our master. We have been transferred because we have been redeemed. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. I've been bought with a price. And what does that tell you about your worth to God? That he would send and sacrifice his son for you. You're precious to him. As are our friends and family and neighbors who need to know about him. In verse 12 again, he has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance. Notice, it's God who did all the work. <laughs> he has enabled you. I think a, a more modern translation of this also has the word qualified you. He has qualified you because of his son and that relationship. He, he has enabled you. All of these things are his doing. It's his gift, it's his grace. Probably the most beloved song in Christianity is Amazing Grace. And over and over and over in that song, it's God gives something we don't deserve. He's giving, he's giving, he's giving, he's giving. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. It's grace. It's a work of God. It's something he did. He, sent, he made the plan. He sent his son. He declared his love. He moved by his spirit. He drew us to his son. You know, he energized us, even in our faith, as we believe. He has enabled us or qualified us. One of the cool things about having some modern resources or having studied some of these things, I know some of your Bibles are study Bibles and they annotate these things, or some of us who have had the privilege of going to seminary and learning, um, this particular... This particular verb here is in a tense that, that helps us understand that this is a completed action. This is something that's already done. This is something that it says, he has qualified you. Period. It's, it's over. Jesus said it is finished. His work is finished. But also, if we're in Christ, the work is finished for us. He has qualified us. These things for the believer have been done. So that is some of what we have Christmas every day. Now, what do they in this passage, what do we need? One of the more interesting uh, sports in the world to me, and actually, if I could be confessional about it, and I'm not trying to offend any of you who do this sport, but in my family, particularly with my youngest daughter, we do this sometimes. We will be out somewhere talking or whatever and need to go somewhere, and we'll just start doing this. Any of you, any of you do this sport? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? power walking or speed walking or whatever it's called. We do it because it's fun to sort of poke fun at each other. It's not, it's not like we're running. We're, we're giving that away, but we're in a big, big kind of hurry. It seems to me 
that speed walking or power walking or race walking or whatever you want to call it is a little bit indicative or illustrative of the Christian life. And I'll give you, I'll give you three quick reasons. One is when the world looks at us as Christians, they think we look pretty silly. Part of the reason that my youngest daughter and I do it is because we look goofy doing it and it's just kind of fun. The world looks at us and thinks we're crazy. Do you know that? They think, they think okay, you, you believe that a spirit being who exists as three in one gave you a book over thousands of years that talks about a guy who became a man and even though he was God, got killed, you say he rose from the dead, but they never found his body and on and on and on. And you get together and you sing these songs and it's kumbaya and whatever. They think we're crazy. They think we're weird. And to some degree, maybe they're right. We are a little weird. Weird means different. We're different than the world. We should be weird to them. But that doesn't mean we're wrong. And some of us gathered yesterday to celebrate Emily Perez's life. And God uses the the things that the world, the people that the world cast aside to powerfully declare the truth of who he is. And that's who we're supposed to be as his children. But they look at us like we're weird. Uh, I did not know this. Uh, there are two basic rules for power walking. One of those rules is that your back toe cannot leave the ground until your front heel hits the ground. There has to be something in contact with the ground at all times. The other rule is you cannot, you cannot unstraighten your leg until your hips go past your leg, your back leg. So, so when you step, that leg has to be straight. That's why they look funny when they do it or when Bethany and I try to imitate them. Um, we look kind of funny. Um, to race well or compete well, you need to know the rules. And that's another similarity between us as Christians and speed walking or, or race walking. Look at verse 9. Since the day we heard about your faith, we haven't stopped praying for you. We are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. That you can live your life according to his plan according to his rules, according to his design, to compete well, to run well, to finish our race, to run the course that God has laid out, to speed walk the course that God has laid out for us. We need to know what is pleasing to him, to be filled with the knowledge of his will, with wisdom and understanding. Wisdom is truth applied to life and spiritual understanding, some awareness about how he wants us to live in this way. Verse 10, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord. Being fully pleasing, bearing fruit. This particular tense has, it stresses the ongoing nature of fruit bearing. So it's saying, live in a way according to his rules, according to his design, that the pattern of your life, and by the way, walking in the New Testament, that's why we say, how's your Christian walk? Because it was their manner of life. So that the manner of our life is bearing fruit, bearing fruit, bearing fruit, bearing fruit. We want that. Growing in the knowledge of God, verse 10. The knowledge of God. This particular knowledge has to do with, it stresses the aspect of learning by experience who God is. A book was written a few years back by a man named Robert Fulgram, or Fulgham, and this book is called All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. It's a bit of an indictment on 21st century Christianity. I hope not on our church. 
it's a bit of an indictment on us that we sort of have that view about Christianity, that all I ever need to know I learned in kindergarten. Yes, I know that Jesus became a man. Yes, I know that he died for sins. Yes, I know that through faith in him, I can be saved. I'm good. I'm going to take my dedication Bible and I'm going to put it on my shelf. And because I know I'm good, I, I'm just, I'll, I'm going to hunt and fish and, you know, live party like rock stars or whatever it is. And when I have a big time need, I'm, I'll, I'll know where the Bible is. I'll go back to it. I know all I need to know. God and I have our time out in nature or whatever. And that's it. That's where we stop. It's almost like all we need to know was in kindergarten. Beloved, let it not be true. Let it not be said of us that, that we act that way. Knowledge in the Christian life is less about knowing what to do or how to do it and more about knowing the one who has told us how to do it. It's about becoming so enamored with him, loving him, understanding him that his desires become our desires. John chapter 17 verse 3 is probably my favorite book or my favorite verse rather in the Bible. This is eternal life that they may know you the one true God and Jesus Christ who you've sent. It's not just about facts, it's about knowing him. It's about dwelling in that kingdom of light, so to speak, about that being our world. It's not rules and regulations and do's and don'ts. It's about being conformed to the image of his son so that we love and hate what he loves and hates. He hates pain. He hates death. He hates abandonment. He hates sickness. He hates cancer. He hates that stuff. And we can hate it too. But we can be people of hope. We can be people of truth because we know him. Gordon Lightfoot, the famous commentator, said, knowledge of God is like the dew or the rain which nourishes the growth of a plant. Go back and read Psalm 63 that the choir sang this morning on your own time. I thirst for you like in a dry and weary land where there is no water Lord I need you I need you we live in an age with Google and satellite TV and the internet and all those sorts of things where we are accustomed to learning lots of interesting things that we never use that we never apply, that we, that we never really hold on to. And knowledge of God is not like that. Knowledge of his word, those things he has spoken are transformative. Is it possible that we don't seek to know God because we don't care to run the race well? We just consume and throw away or look and brush aside or whatever. Completed distances of these races, these power walking races, um, that at the competition level are average either 20 kilometers or 50 kilometers. That's 12 or about 31 miles. The average race walker at eight mile an hour pace and a 50 kilometer course will burn over 3,500 calories. So race walking shows us that sometimes we look goofy. It shows us that we need to compete according to the rules, but it also shows that we need strength. We need power, we need energy. So this, what we need, knowledge of his will, verse nine. Strength and power, verse 11. May you be strengthened with all power for your race, if you need it, according to his glorious might. This endless supply of energy, we run and seek according to his will and run according to his power. 
And is it possible that we don't pray and we don't dig and we don't, we don't cry out to him and we don't ask other people to pray for us because we're not exerting ourselves? We don't see a need for God's wisdom. We don't see a need for his power because we're not living and engaging the Christian life. We're not running well. And lastly, what we need is joy and thankfulness. Verse 12, with joy, giving thanks to God the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. G.K. Chesterton, Chesterton once said, when it comes to life, the critical thing is whether you take things for granted or take them with gratitude. Helen Keller, the speaker and author who was born blind and deaf, once said that in her relationship with God, think about this, a blind and deaf woman, in her relationship with God, she found that if she focused on all he had given her, all the blessings that were her, she did not have time to think about what he had withheld from her. But how often is it the case for us that we think about what we perceive that he's withheld? and miss the blessings that he's given, grace upon grace upon grace. Are we walking in a way, in the manner of our lives that require God's power, that require his strength for endurance? Do we have our hand to the plow, plowing hard? Are we trying to honor him with our lives? Do we know that we need him? When was the last time that you prayed for wisdom to know how to live a life that honors God in your situation? Not, Lord, I, I want this, or Lord, please give me that, uh, just in, in terms of stuff or the world, but I need you, Lord. I need you to know how to handle this difficult situation. I need you to know how to speak to this person whatever that is, to share your son. When was the last time you read your Bible personally? And if, if, you don't, if we don't, pick it up. What is it saying? We're saying we don't need it. We're saying we don't need what the Lord has to say or what he thinks. When was the last time, even in the middle of our trials, that we said, Lord, we need the strength to endure this not just for our own satisfaction, but so that we can testify well of you. Lord, help me persevere in such a way that brings honor to your name. When was the last time we prayed that? Or whatever. And then one of the big lessons in this passage, because it's the Holy Spirit working through Paul for a given church, is he's praying for them. So are we praying for each other? in this regard. Beloved, redeemed people, we need God's power to walk worthily. We need his help to live a God-honoring, Christ-honoring life. This would be a great passage. If I could give you an application challenge for today, it would be to think about someone, maybe even someone that you don't particularly like, that you know is a Christian, and pray this passage for him or for her. I haven't stopped praying for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, so that you may walk worthily, so, so that we're interceding for each other. R right now, think of someone you can pray this prayer for, and pray this prayer, this spirit-inspired prayer for someone this week, maybe even today. If you want to step it up and get extra credit, pick a different person every day this week and pray this prayer. And God will use it. God will bless it for sure. Are we redeemed? Do we care? Are we walking by his power? Are we listening? Alex and the worship team are going to help us think about being redeemed in this next song. If you have a, a decision you'd like to announce to the church or you, you would like to enter into a time of prayer, 
um, the altar will be open. If you would stand and let's sing about our Redeemer, hymn, hymn number 279.